Welcome to livingpianos.com live YouTube event. Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to bring this to you. You know, I started making videos on YouTube 10 years ago. It's hard to believe. And I just looked up and we have 1,039 videos. This will be the 1,040th video on YouTube. And how is it even possible? Well, consistently over these 10 years, every week I've been bringing you these videos, but this is the first time we have a live video and I welcome all your questions. We're gonna address some questions that people gave me during the week and I'll start with those and then we'll move forward and try to get a conversation going here. This is an opportunity, anything I can show you on the piano or any information I can provide for you, happy to do so. So let's see what we've got here. And uh, these are questions that came in all week long. Helen asks, we bought an Estonia grand piano and bought a dehumidifier for the room and couldn't stand the sound it made. We are planning on getting a dehumidifier that is connected to the furnace. Do you think that's a good idea for a piano? Well, this is a really, really excellent point. In fact, treating your house, it doesn't get any better than that. If your whole house is around 45 degrees humidity, stable temperature, your piano is going to love you and you're gonna love your piano. Now, of course, that's not always practical. You know, sometimes, uh, for example, people live at the beach. Do you really want to close all your windows all the time? I don't think so. So there are other technologies that you can use in those situations. For example, the Piano Lifesaver system, formerly called the Damp Chaser system, goes underneath the piano with a humidistat that engages heating rods whenever the humidity gets too high, keeping the soundboard stable. Is it as good as a dehumidifier in the room? No, but it's certainly a lot better than nothing. So yeah, treating, treating their house, boy, that's an ideal situation. I would go for it. There's a second part to this question. Let's see what we have here. Also wondered if pedals can be affected by too much humidity. Even when I'm not using the pedals, many notes are sustained. My husband is wondering if these two separate problems would love to get your opinion. Actually, it sounds like it's perfectly related. Humidity causes all sorts of issues on pianos. Now, growing up, my father's studio had two grand pianos in it, and the first few years we lived in the house, there was no air conditioning. And in the summer, everything would get mushy feeling, you'd lose the repetition, it was a nightmare. Even the tone of the piano changed dramatically, so that everything was, had a dull, lifeless sound because the hammers absorbed moisture. So the dampers themselves, what happens is, they, they have uh, bushings and they go on rods and the felt expands with moisture. And this happens with the whole action. So it's not just notes hanging up because of humidity. You might have sluggish keys, all sorts of problems. So yes, get that whole home dehumidifier and you'll be in great shape. Second best is treat the room. If you can stand the noise, you find a quieter dehumidifier. Otherwise a damp chaser system that goes in your piano not the best option, but definitely the least expensive option of what we've been talking about here. So let's have some more questions. Going on, Richard asks, why buy an acoustical grand piano when the new digital pianos play two or three different grand piano types and have many other features? Well, I've talked a great deal about this and indeed, digital pianos have come such a long way. It's amazing what you can get now for such a reasonable price. You can get a weighted graded action that gives you the same resistance as a grand piano. And indeed the sound isn't just of a small piano. You've got the sound of a nine foot concert grand right in your living room. It never needs to be tuned. You can play with headphones. More than that, there are so many different functions digital pianos can do recording you, music education software, whole production suites. So why would anybody want to get an acoustic piano? Well, the experience of playing a piano, a real piano, can't be matched by even the best technology. As good as they are and the benefits that they offer could well be make it the right instrument for you. But if you want that organic connection to the sound, on a traditional piano, acoustic piano, like this concert grand, for example, there isn't just one sound or three sounds or five sounds. There's actually infinite levels of expression on every note. Like if I took one note on this Baldwin concert grand and played it with different articulations and different pedalings, listen to how many different sounds are possible on one note on a great concert grand. Now, I'm not going to try for anything particularly pretty. I'm just going to 
show a range of tone and you'll listen to all the different sounds and there isn't a digital piano that can quite get all the different tones out of one note as you're going to hear right now. digital sampling technology works is they take several different recordings of each note and so it kind of goes between different recordings so it's a quantized number of sounds now they've been augmented with different technologies physical modeling of the pedals and the duplex and so many aspects have become more and more expressive but still it's not infinitely expressive the way a great piano is so you gotta determine for yourself what's important to you. Is it having the ultimate playing experience or are you in a living situation where maybe it's not practical, you can't disturb neighbors and you want the sound of a bigger piano and some of the capabilities I talked about. Another great question there, huh? So let's see what we have here coming in for you. Stephanie asks, are the Kimball made pianos with the Busendorfer scale design different from how other Kimball pianos sound? Well, Kimball was an American manufacturer in Indiana, as a matter of fact, and they bought, I believe it was in the 1960s or 70s, they bought Busendorfer, the great, venerable Austrian manufacturer of pianos. They made a select number of models that utilized the Busendorfer scale design. So do they sound different? Well, before I answer that, let me just mention that if you were to play brand new pianos of the same make and same model, right next to each other in a store, everyone sounds different. So certainly those models will sound different from the American scale designs. Now the question that is even more interesting is, how similar do they sound to the Austrian made Busendorfers? And while there's a great deal of similarities, there are different choices of materials with the hammers, the different woods of the soundboard. So they are not going to sound quite the same as their uh, Viennese counterparts. However, they're going to be extremely close because it's the same plate design, the same basic scale design, and they're going to sound much closer to that European sound than the American-made Kimballs. And I believe that the finest Kimballs ever made were the Viennese models, particularly, I believe it's the six foot seven inch Kimball. Very, very nice piano. We've had a few of them here at Living Pianos. Walter asks, Yamaha N-Series versus Real Good Grand, where to try? Well, what is the N-Series? The N-Series is a new breed of hybrid pianos, the Avant Grand Series of Yamaha. And they're not the only hybrid pianos out there. In fact, Casio has the Grand Hybrid Selviano Series that we have right here. You can check them out on our website. And Kawai has their Novus Series. This is a brand new breed of pianos, a new category of pianos. It used to be, when I was a kid, the only kind of piano was a real piano like this. And electric pianos were nothing like real pianos. They were cool, you know, Fender Rhodes was kind of the epitome, but a lot of piano teaching labs had the Wurlitzer electric pianos. They didn't sound anything like pianos. It wasn't until digital technology in the 80s made it possible to have a, something that sounded like a piano. Well, what are the hybrid pianos? Hybrid pianos are neither digital pianos nor are they acoustic pianos. They have elements of both. So essentially, hybrid pianos are the front end of a traditional piano, something that is very similar to the action of a traditional piano, but the sound generation is done digitally. Now, why is this such a good choice? Because the capabilities with physical modeling and sampling has come such a long way that you can get really pretty phenomenal sound and a very high degree of expressiveness, but the touch is never the same. Consider that when you play a single note on a piano, you're setting into motion about a hundred parts. There's no digital piano that really replicates that, except some hybrid pianos do. So you can have the feel of a traditional concert grand piano and digitally the sound of a concert grand. So it could be a tremendous choice in certain situations. For example, there are certain places where pianos just can't hold up. Have you ever played practice room pianos? I mean, anybody who has, is probably suffered through them because pianos are not meant to be able to be played 20 hours a day. What happens is the hammers get hard from impacting the strings, strings start to break, 
then new strings are put in, they don't hold their tuning, so you have these terribly out of tune pianos that are bright and offensive tone because it's impossible to service practice room pianos to really play on a top level. So a hybrid piano could be a perfect choice because it's consistent. Also places with severe climates, hybrids are wonderful because try putting a piano on for somebody who lives on a yacht or even at the beach. And as I talked about earlier, the moisture can be pretty dramatic how it affects the sound and the touch. So hybrid pianos can be a great choice and it's a new breed and I guarantee you over the coming years, they will become more and more popular. I just hope I never live to see the day when somebody sees a real piano and says, what's that? <laughs> you know, Because hybrid pianos offer the potential of getting a higher level playing experience for far less money. And eventually that threshold crosses where they will overtake grand pianos and upright pianos to a much greater extent than they have today. All right, and by the way, anybody who've got questions, I'm welcome to take them in. As a matter of fact, it looks like we have one in. Our engineer, Chris, can uh, tell me what it is and I'm happy to address it here. What have we got, Chris? Robert, Lefty Smalls would like to ask, any tips for getting rid of the flying pinky? The flying pinky, we've all suffered to that. No, really, seriously, the flying pinky? I'm not sure what exactly what you mean by that, uh, but I wouldn't worry about it unless you're in a situation where your pinky can't get to the next note in time. Let it do what it's going to do. You know, as a matter of fact, having a little bit of travel for your pinky can sometimes enable you to get more power out of it in certain circumstances. One thing that you can do, however, if you're finding that your pinky or any finger is not right over a key at the time you need it to be, Try playing right up to the point where that note plays and stop with that finger over that note. So for example, um, let's see, what's a good example? Okay, um, well, this isn't the pinky necessarily, but going over an octave. In the middle of the Chopin A flat ballade, you have a section like this. Now, let's say I was afraid of missing that final B flat octave in both hands. How about I go right up to it, get over that B flat octave, and not play it? Let me show you what I mean. I was right over it. You can do that several times until you're over it way before you need to be. And that's the secret to not missing it, to be able to get that octave with security is to be over it before you need to be. So whether it's a pinky or any of your fingers, try practicing right to the point where you want to be over those keys, but don't play it. Just practice getting over it soon enough. And that might help with your flying pinky problem. All right, keep those questions coming in. It's very thought provoking, I gotta tell you. So let's see, if I've got a few more that people have sent in to me. Um, Don, Donald asks, what about Hupfeld, Velti? Duo Art and Ampico, are they still around and capable of full restoration for less than a king's ransom? Now you might wonder, what the heck is he talking about? Well, I happen to know what he's talking about. If you go back over a hundred years, uh, it was the heyday, or around a hundred years, of player pianos. They go back, they have their roots in the 19th century, if you can believe it, with the Vorsetzer, which was a contraption that could record the performances of fine pianists and play them back with all the expression. That was a very time-consuming, tedious process of capturing Rachmaninoff and Gershwin and Debussy's performances and Paderewski's and so many of the great pianists, even before the advent of audio recording or when it was in its infancy, we have these recordings digitized that can play on modern day player pianos. But what about the actual paper roll, pneumatic player pianos that were so popular a hundred years ago? Can you still get those restored? Well, I got to admit, it's a dying art. There are so few people who do that kind of work, and the few people I know of who do restore those player pianos are ancient. I mean, most of them are older than I am because they go back to an age when they were still around, and it's, it's really hard to find anyone to do that work. It's extremely time-consuming. Consider player pianos from 100 years ago, not the mechanical type, saloon-type pianos, but even those to an extent, have thousands of parts and each of the 88 keys has a pneumatic for it and there's big bellows and there's pumps and it's such a complicated contraption that restoring them takes 
you know, hundreds if not thousands of hours of tedious hand work. So if you can find somebody to do that work, it may well be worth it to you. Half the time though, you find a piano that had a player system in it and the player's been long since ripped out and you just got a piano, which isn't so bad because you can always use it as a piano. They are functionally the same usually as a traditional piano, but restoring them, extremely expensive. And it looks like Donald has a second part to this question. Also, is there such a thing as a piano that is too old? For example, in 1880 Steinway, Beckstein, the Bluthner or Chickering. Is World War I the cutoff date for safe pianos to purchase? Well, it's not so simple. You see, companies, for example, like Steinway, they were making fully modern pianos, not unlike the pianos they're producing today, way back in the 1880s. They had their Model M and their Model, well, I'm not sure about the M, but certainly the Model B and the Model D, and many of their models have the same scale design, essentially, that they're building today. And the actions were fully modern piano actions. So in that case, is it too old? Well, then it comes down to condition. Certainly a piano from the 1880s. I've never seen a piano quite that old that was all original and still in great shape. We've had pianos not that much newer than that, that our record, by the way, we had a 1907 Steinway O, all original, that played like a dream, didn't require any new parts to play at a super high level. That's extremely rare. But the other thing to consider is this. Many companies, and uh, Dusendorfer comes to mind, Dusendorfer was using the Viennese action, which is the predecessor to the modern English action, which all pianos today are based upon. What's the difference? Well, in a nutshell, Modern pianos, you push a key and the hammer goes up like that. And that's the way all pianos work today. The Viennese piano, which goes back to Mozart's time, you push a key and the hammer comes up like this. So it was backwards, completely different technology. Busendorfer has always been like the Viennese in general, uh, very conservative. Did you ever look at the Vienna Philharmonic? Look at the trumpets they use and the French horns they use. It's a period orchestra. I'm also a French hornist, and the French horns in the Vienna Philharmonic are not modern horns. They use the Vienna valve, which is not the modern rotary valve found on French horns in every other orchestra in the world. And they're single F horns. They don't have the benefit of the trigger, which gets rid of three feet of tubing, making it a little easier to play. They play the old fashioned way on these Vienna horns, get an incredibly rich sound. The trumpets, have the old sidewinder, which are rotary valves instead of the typical piston valves you find on trumpets. Well, so it is with pianos. Dusendorf were, even today, most of their models, or many of their models, don't have the continuous rim. You can see a seam in the rim of the piano. And indeed, they were making Vienna actions well into the 20th century. So a piano like that is nothing like a modern piano. Blutner had their own type of action that they didn't convert to a modern action until later on. So the year of the piano is one factor, but the manufacturer combined with the year is going to tell you if it's a fully modern piano. And then the issue of condition is a whole other story. And of course, we're always here to provide good information. If you send us pictures, we're happy to, to give you any information from uh, pianos that you might find out there that you wonder about. So we're always available for you for that. So. Let's see if we have any more. And remember, you can always ask questions. We're here for you. That, that was a great one. Now we have one more question here, and that is, viewer asks, wondering about wiring up my 510 Kawhi that is about 30 years old to make it a hybrid. What is the approximate cost? How long does it take a technician to do the job? And is it a good idea to do that to my piano? Well, technically, you can't really turn a traditional piano into a hybrid as such. However, there are technologies uh, that can come to bear. For example, the silent piano, maybe that's your, what you're referring to. The silent piano puts a bar in front of the hammer so it can't quite hit the strings, thereby making the piano not produce any sound. Then, by putting a MIDI strip, making the piano send out over USB to another sound source, you can listen with headphones or over speakers. So it's sort of a hybrid. Now, the thing I would caution you about doing this to a piano, 
is unless you get a factory installed, I know that Yamaha, for example, has technology so that it moves the strike point of the action so that the action feels exactly the same whether you're using the silent system or not. But any aftermarket uh, silent system that I'm aware of, you have to kind of compromise the touch on either playing the piano normally or playing it with the silent system because the hammers are going to stop just short of the proper strike point with the silent system. So you have to compromise the action, either optimize one or the other, or have, have it regulated somewhere between. So that's a caveat for you if you're a high level player. The other thing is, you know, for the price it's gonna cost you to do that, you could get a heck of a good digital piano or even possibly a hybrid piano, like I mentioned the Grand Hybrid Casios are very reasonable cost. And you could get the sound of a concert grand a good quality hammer action and have it in another room you can play with headphones. So it really depends on the purpose of why you're wanting to convert your piano, whether a silent system is the way to go or just a second piano you can have somewhere else in your home. And I oftentimes recommend this to people. To have, the, particularly if you already have a digital piano, you're thinking about getting a grand, keep your digital piano. You've got a world of software options, music production tools, that you can use on a digital piano easily without having to doctor your piano and spending thousands. Last thing to consider whenever adding technology to your piano is this. Your piano can be 20, 30 years old like this piano, or it can be 100 years old, and yet the technology is modern because the piano was fully developed well over 100 years ago, as I mentioned earlier. But any technology you put in your piano will age out because we're in a time where, you know, if your phone is more than two years old, you know, people wonder, should I get a new phone? How many of us have 10 year old computers? Not too many, I'm guessing. Uh, and the same thing is true with pianos. If you put a system on your piano that's technology dependent, modern technology, who knows how long they're gonna support those parts should you need replacement parts in 10 or 15 years, it's questionable whether that technology is going to endure. So you might think twice. The last thing I'm gonna mention for you is if you're planning to do any kind of retrofit on your piano, whether it's silent piano, player technology, make sure you get a great technician who has vast experience installing because the surgery on your piano, done correctly, doesn't affect your playing of the piano at all. But there was a big if there, if the technician has vast experience. So our technician, I would have no qualms about having him install one on my piano because he's been specializing it since the 80s. He knows how to do it right. So if any of you are thinking about doing some kind of retrofit to your piano, once again, you can contact us. We're happy to give you insights about what you can expect and possibly make recommendations of people in your area. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, it's been a real pleasure having you. And Chris, are there any other questions that I can address here while we're still on the air? Absolutely. Miles would like to know, how could one find an apprenticeship with a piano technician? His dream job would be to be the chief concert technician of Bussendorf or Steinway. Are there any brick and mortar schools? Yes, as a matter of fact, there are. There's the, I believe it's called William Bennett School, where you can go and take classes and get certified to be a piano technician. There's even a Piano Technician's Academy online where you can do everything for the privacy of your own home. Naturally, you want to have a place where you can have pianos to work on. And sure, having an apprenticeship is an ideal situation. In fact, for many years, for generations, that is the traditional way people learned the craft of piano technical work. So finding somebody is tough though. You'd think that a technician would love to have somebody to help them out, but until you get enough experience, it takes them more time to train you than any possible benefit they can get from you. As far as Steinway or Busendorfer or any of the top manufacturers taking you in as an apprentice, you better have some skill sets behind you before they're going to consider you because of the high level work that's demanded you know, maybe you could sweep the shop floor at the beginning, or if you are decent at tuning, maybe they'll let you do chip tunings. Chip tunings are when a piano's just been strong, it has to be tuned a bunch of times just to get it in the zone. But it's gonna be a long time before when a company like Steinway or Busendorfer or Beckstein is going to allow you to be doing any fine work on their pianos. So you might find a local technician who is, you know, enamored with the idea of sharing their craft. 
And I hope any of you listening, you know, you can ask us and we'll try to recommend put people together, if any technicians who are looking for apprentices, and we'll, you know, email us and we'll do the best we can. Info at livingpianos.com. You can contact us there. And by the way, any of you who is not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, we have fresh videos every week. We've been doing this for 10 years, like I mentioned. Love to have you join us and get notices of other videos. And any last questions here for us while we're still live for you? James H. would like to know, what are your practice tips to continually improve? Anything to make scales, drills, etc. interesting? I find them so boring, I am impatient to start playing a song. <laughs> well, for one thing, I think a lot of people, from judging from the questions I get oftentimes, a lot of people are under the misconception that the vast majority of time spent practicing should be spent doing scales, arpeggios, and exercises. Now, I'm not dismissing the essential aspect of exercises, particularly scales and arpeggios, in piano playing or any instrument. However, the good news about piano repertoire is it's so vast that most of what you want to learn how to do, you can learn through repertoire. Spend 10, 15 minutes a day on scales, arpeggios, and exercises, and that should be plenty for you. And how to make them more interesting? Don't try to do too much. Don't try to take too many scales try to perfect something. It's a real satisfaction to get something, even if it's 60, one note to the beat. With the metronome ticking, by the way, going through like that is so satisfying. You get to dig your fingers into every note securely, developing independence and strength. Much like a dancer will do slow stretching, slow exercise on the piano are the secret to developing a secure technique, not just with scales and arpeggios, but with your repertoire. There is no better way to solidify your musical performance than to go back and play it slowly with the score without pedal using the metronome. It is a staple, I would say, of the vast majority of fine pianists, what I just described. So take that to heart, James, and see if that doesn't make your scale and arpeggio practice a little bit more enjoyable. Anyway, I want to thank everyone for being here today again at livingpianos.com, Living Pianos videos here at YouTube. It's been fun bringing this live. You know, it's a funny thing because all the videos I've done over all these years have done been done essentially live, we turn on the cameras and I roll it, right? But there's something exciting about doing this actually live for you that feels different, doesn't it? And I want all your opinions about that. Let me know how you've enjoyed this. And if you'd like to see more future live shows. All right, again, I'm Robert Eschen here at livingpianos.com, your online piano store. We will see you next time. Thanks so much for joining me.